Welcome everyone to another Walker webcast. I'm uh, really excited to have my guest, Deborah Cafaro, joining me today. If you missed last week's discussion with Whoop founder, Will Ahmed, uh, you can listen to the replay on Walker Dunlop's YouTube channel or on our podcast, Driven by Insight. Uh, if some of you watched the Wells Fargo Classic Golf Tournament this last weekend, you saw Whoop athlete, Roy McElroy win the tournament wearing his Whoop strap I know that WHOOP, the PGA, and its broadcasters are working to broadcast the PGA players' heart rate from their WHOOP straps to show fans what's going on in the players' physiology as they step up to approach critical shots in the future. That should be a lot of fun to watch, and uh, maybe when Deb and I talk about her ownership in the Pittsburgh Penguins, we can figure out whether maybe we'll be also watching the same type of data from hockey players. Uh, lots going on in the markets. Um, a lot of inflationary pressures. I would remind people on the inflationary pressures that we are looking at data that is off of extremely low numbers for March, April, and May of last year, and that we're clearly going to see some pretty big prints here. Uh, but all of the data that we're looking at right now, whether it's a stock price on various companies being up 100% over the last year, you have to also remember that uh, those stock prices are probably where they would have been without the pandemic. Uh, having come across. So while people are sitting there saying markets look really frothy and companies have gained a huge amount of value on the year look back, I would strongly encourage people to do a two-year look back on most stock charts. Um, and we will get into Ventus's two-year stock chart because Debbie and her stock chart have been a thing of, of beauty over the last uh, 20 plus years. Uh, final thing I'd say is that uh, I went back and looked in my interview with Peter Linneman um, from uh, three weeks ago has been uh, watched by 87,000 people subsequent to Peter and I speaking. If you want to get the real inside from a fantastic economist and also real estate uh, maven guru, what have you, a good friend of Debbie Zen mine, Peter Linneman, you can go back and watch that. Okay. Deborah Cafaro is chief executive officer and chairwoman of the board of Ventus. Uh, in addition to her work at Ventus, Cafaro is broadly engaged across the business, public policy, arts, academic, sports, and nonprofit sectors. She serves on the board of directors of PNC. She is chairwoman of the Real Estate Roundtable, chairwoman of the Executive Committee, and a member of the board of directors of the Economic Club of Chicago. And she is a member of the board of trustees of the University of Chicago and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. I could call you Mrs. Chicago very easily, Deb. Deb earned her BA magna cum laude from the University of Notre Dame and her JD cum laude from the University of Chicago Law School, where she was named its 2011 Distinguished Alumna. Finally, she is an owner and member of the management committee of the Pittsburgh Penguins. And if all that wasn't enough, she is a six-time honoree in Harvard Business Review's Top 100 CEOs from 2014 to 2020, and Modern Healthcare's 100 Most Influential People in Healthcare, 2012, 15, and 2019. So, Dev, let me start with your childhood. Growing up in Pittsburgh as the grandchild of immigrants from Lebanon and Italy, a father who was a mailman, and where the drive that makes Deb Kafaro the incredible success that you are comes from. Well, thank you. It's great to be here, Willie, and uh, I'm very excited for our conversation. Um, I really love talking about my parents and my childhood because in many ways I am very much the same working class girl from Pittsburgh that I've always been, maybe with a few affectations here or there. Um, but the drive really came from my parents, I believe. Um, we know that immigrants come here to seek a better life for their families, not so much for themselves, because often they make great sacrifices to do that. And uh, there is a self-selection that goes on when people pick up and leave everything they've ever known so that they can make a better life for their children and their grandchildren. And my parents' parents did that. And they were very intelligent, incredibly hardworking people. And as a result, um, I benefited from that drive from them and the opportunities that they worked so hard to give me. And then, of course, a lot of luck. I know it's a lot more than a lot of luck. One thing 
Debbie, that I've noticed about you for as long as I've known you is that you have an incredibly generous spirit. You have a generous spirit about all that you do. And as you built your career, one of the major hallmarks that I've watched is that rather than thinking about what was in something for you, you've thought about what is in it for others. And as a result of that, that has made you be wildly valuable and influential to those relationships. But that generosity, if you will, of spirit, as much as I get it from your parents and that nuclear family, um, you didn't grow up with the means to be terribly generous. Where's the, that's, the, that's the kind of the conflict in my mind of you have this incredible sense of giving, and yet you didn't grow up with a whole lot. Well, thank you for that compliment. Honestly, I value what you just said more than anything you could say about me. Um, but I did get it from my parents. I look back now with all the benefits of the environments that all of us traffic in and all of the embarrassment of, of you know, gifts that we have. And I look back at my parents and they were so generous and they had nothing. They had absolutely nothing, as you say, but they always had an extra plate at the table. They always, I talked to one of my cousins last night who reminded me that we used to put plates out in the depression when we had, you know, with the grandparents, when they had nothing because they still had a little bit more than the next guy. And that generosity of spirit, the heart, the empathy really definitely comes from my parents. And I don't have nearly as much as they did, um, even though their, their circumstances were so much less. And um, really, I marvel at it when I look back now at some of the things that my parents did under the conditions that they live. It's, it's amazing. So you've talked a lot about the role your parents played and also the fact that your father invested a lot of time and attention in you and your sister. And, mm -hmm. and back then, if you will, most working class men didn't spend a whole lot of time kind of investing in promoting their daughters per you, not, not per my take on that, but you, you've said that before. Right. Talk to me. There's a story that I heard you tell about going to uh, watch a football game in 1972, the Pittsburgh Steelers playing against the Oakland Raiders and actually being there to watch Terry Bradshaw throw the immaculate reception uh, to uh, win the game at Three Rivers Stadium. Talk about being at that game with your dad. Yes, and it, it's so funny. I even think about with my own children now, this is really the memory making business when we go to sporting events together because here I am still talking about this so many years later. Um, it was the greatest play in NFL history, I have to say that. Um, but my father, really, as a first-generation Italian-American, he had 10 sisters and one brother. And really, girls were totally devalued in that environment. I mean, it was a given. It was an open fact. Um, and somehow, my father really overcame that with his two daughters. And we really were very close. He was our biggest supporters, my sisters and mine. Um, and part of that was going to sporting events. My mother was also a big sports fan. And um, they were at the 1960 Game 7 of the World Series when Mazeroski hit the famous home run, my mother and father were. So this is really deep-seated. And somehow my father, his love for my sister and me made him overcome his sort of socioeconomic uh, DNA. And he was just a huge supporter. And so we did lots of sporting things together. And we were at that famous game. And we were sitting in our seats. And we said, oh, let's go. So we actually left our seats. And then my father said, well, let's watch one more play before we leave. And so we stood at the top of the section. And of course, then once Franco Harris scored the touchdown, pandemonium broke loose. And I would never forgive ourselves if uh, we had really left right before the Immaculate Reception. 
I actually rewatched the videotape of that, Deb, and I was actually looking for you in the stands of all these people <laughs> jumping up and down. I was like, I wonder whether I can find Deb in this in this. Well, view. we weren't in the cheap It was seat, pandemonium. We certainly weren't way up front, Willie. <laughs> yeah, well, they panned the whole stadium. Um, so you were valedictorian of your high school class and the first member of your family to go to college. Um, and I there's a there's a story that you tell. Talk about how rare coins played a role in getting you through college. Mm -hmm. And this also goes to drive really, and it's a great example. Uh, so my father was a mailman, he delivered the mail, and that was a good, secure kind of federal job and very sought after actually. And um, he loved numbers. He was super smart with numbers. And someone gave my mom a silver dollar because those were in circulation those days. And because it was a specific date and condition, it was worth $20. And so my father, of course, thought, wow, this is great. I'd probably make this much in a day in the you know cold and rain and sleep delivering the mail. This is pretty amazing. So he got smart about which were the rare ones. And he used to get his mail paycheck every week in silver dollars. He would take his paycheck to the bank. The bank would give him his paycheck in silver dollars, he would bring them home. We would put them out on the dining room table and look through them to see if he got the rare ones. And then he would go sell them. And he did this as a, he had two jobs for a long time, kind of. He had, I guess you'd call it a side hustle now, but that's what he, you know. And he started then making more money with the silver dollars than he was making at the post office. And what amazes me again, when I look back is, Everyone in America could have done that. There were no barriers to entry. And it, what was it about my dad, the entrepreneurial spirit, the love of numbers, the kind of laziness that we always accused him of because he didn't want to deliver the mail, that he just saw a better way to make a buck. And um, that really propelled him to open a small coin shop in downtown Pittsburgh and you know, to, he would always say his proudest day was when he was able to write that check for me to go to Notre Dame my freshman year. And it was all from that. So you went to Notre Dame and then after Notre Dame went on to law school at the University of Chicago. And yeah. you went out and we went into private practice and you were a, you were a lawyer for 13 years. And um, during that period of time, you started to work with Equity Group and you got to know Sam Zell and you got to know David Nethercut. I wonder, Deb, in self-reflection, what was it about you as a lawyer that made such successful business people like Sam and David not only hire you, because we all hire lots of professionals, but take a personal interest in you and your career? Again, I am so fortunate. And it, it wasn't just the two, it was Shelly Rosenberg. It was Doug Crocker, who was also a client, Richard Kincaid, that whole group of people and um, they, what I hope I offered them was an, you know, a prodigious work ethic. I would really take all the messy parts. You know, I, I, I would do whatever the client needed within the bounds of the law to accomplish an objective. And it didn't matter if it was something I wanted to do. It didn't matter if I new things about it. For example, Shelly asked me to work on tax exempt bonds at one point, and I didn't really want to do it, but what could be more boring in some ways, but I did it, and that actually led to my business career. So it was also a love of numbers. I've never taken a business class, but I love numbers. I understand business. I think I am became commercial, although I wasn't at the beginning. I love deals, and I hope that I always gave them back more than they expected, um, and that's really, and we built real friendships. I mean, there was no networking or anything like that. We built real friendships based on mutual trust and respect, and as a lawyer, you can't hope for more than that with who you have as your clients. So you're one of only two women on that list of the hundred top CEOs that the Harvard Business Review published. 
And you've talked a lot about females in business, the lack of female CEOs, um, but you've also talked about that middle period of female careers. Beginning part, you're coming out of college, it's men and women and employers basically are hiring both. Later on in life, you get to your level and you are going head to head with every single male in, in the corporate world as it relates to board appointments and all the incredible things that you do both inside and outside of work. But you talk about that middle period and how difficult that is for women. And I think about your career and being having moved up in the legal profession and then all of a sudden making that transfer over to the corporate world right in the middle of those middle years. Talk for a moment about how challenging that was. And if you were to give advice to a talented woman who is in those middle years today with those challenges between work demands and home demands, what would you advise them to think about? Well, that's a quite a question. Hmm. Um, first of all, in terms of CEOs, even in, in the S&P 500, there are still only 5% women CEOs overall. So that is really important to understand the context after, after all these years. And some of that is this attrition that we see um, mostly in the middle parts with young children, um, not exclusively. And what I would suggest, I've made a lot of sacrifices for my career and I consider them just choices. We all make choices in life, whether we're men or women. And at its foundation, you really need to know who you are and what you want. And not everyone wants the same thing. Um, I never sought balance. I sought achievement, excellence, um, learning, uh, broadening, having new experiences. And um, that's not for everyone. Um, I, I think we all need to make those choices and we need to unflinchingly understand ourselves and not what our spouse wants for us, our parents, what we thought we wanted for ourselves, but who we truly are. And when you can really assess that, the rest really falls into place because you can then make decisions with confidence and organize your life accordingly. And so that's the advice that I would give and be willing to take some risks, be willing to do kind of an upside downside analysis to say, hey, if I want this thing and I'm gonna go for it, if I fail, then where will I be? Will I still be better off? Can I recover? just like you would in a deal. And that can help you make good career decisions. So you just did an interview this week for the Economic Club of Chicago with Jane Frazier, the new CEO of Citigroup and the first female to run a major US bank. What was the one question or her response to your question that stands out from that interview, Deb? Well, for me, when I think about running these behemoth financial institutions, and, and you know something about that. Um, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't call us a behemoth, but I appreciate well, the compliment. I, I just can't imagine how they run these organizations. And of course, City, with its global footprint and its own history, seems really, really hard to run. Again, you know, over $2 trillion in assets. It's, it's just in 160 countries, I mean, think about running that thing. And so what I was drawn to with Jane is, first of all, she's a rock star. I, I love brains, Willie. I, and she is very, very brainy. And I also love financial services. And so when I asked her about running City, what really struck me was her belief that she will be able to take the best of cities globality is what is the word that that she used 
and its footprint and reconcile that with increasing simplicity and focus. And that's a challenge. Did that make you think, I know Ventus is in the UK, did, did her comments about globality make you think about taking Ventus to, to new places around the globe where you aren't today? Well, my, my wanderlust and desire to travel would certainly encourage me that way. We've looked many, many times at other jurisdictions in healthcare, uh, but I still think the best risk reward for us in our big fragmented market is in the U.S. So I'll so just take vacations to these other places. Yeah, I was going to say you might need a bigger plane as well. <laughs> um, so let, let's dive into Ventus for a second, because um, the story is unbelievable. And it's it's not, uh, as, as you and I have spoken before, um, having the long-term outlook that you and I both share for shareholder value and sort of getting in and grinding it out every single day. Um, both of us can look back on track records as public companies with fantastic success there. But as it relates to Ventus, I mean, when you came in in 2000, it was a, it was a turnaround, first of all. It had a market cap of $200 million. And today, 20 years later, it has a market cap of over $20 billion. Um, the compound annual growth of that in your stock price has been well over 20%. What is it as you look back on that? And I'm going to, I'm going to take away a couple of your answers to try and get at the real core here. I know you have a great team. I know you went into a part of the market that didn't have a lot of competition, Yes. but beyond those two things, which are very important building a great team and finding a market that doesn't have a lot of competition to it are two huge factors. But there's something about Deb Kafaro and the way you have built this success that I want to try and understand a little more about. Okay. So calling Ventus a turnaround in 1999 is a huge compliment <laughs> because it was a train wreck. Um, and, you know, it is interesting that, um, uh, I was called by Doug Crocker, my old client, to do this job, and I didn't know anything about healthcare. And uh, it's a real lesson to me in um, really taking risks, right, with your career and, and really assessing the upside, downside in it, because it was so far gone, I believe that no one would ever blame me if the thing went haywire. But on the other hand, I could learn to be a CEO after a very short professional career in, in business. It was only 18 months at Ambassador Apartments. And, you know, maybe I could learn about healthcare. And I really thought CE, public company CEO jobs were kind of like coaching. You know, people like to hire people who'd been in the seats. It really didn't even matter whether you were good or bad in some ways. So I thought the upside in my career of taking this job that uh, Doug offered was a good idea. And um, that really, that attitude, and I think that optimism and the willingness to learn about healthcare and really, really get my fingernails dirty with kind of nothing being above above me and just getting in there, learning, to, trying to really understand what mattered, okay? And at the beginning, all that mattered was survival. So just focusing on, okay, we have to survive. How do we do that? And that involved kind of changing out the team that was there. It involved bringing in third-party experts who hadn't been at the company, who knew how to fight the good fight for survival. And that was critically important at the beginning. After we survived, and there, was, there were many times when we thought we wouldn't, um, after that, we thought we had something of value that I thought other people would want. And there, the key insights were really about the demographics, about the fact that this was a gigantic market, about the fact that it was really fragmented and no one else was really doing anything. And the simple ideas that, well, 
the demographics are in support. There's investment opportunities. Um, I knew that having one tenant who was bankrupt was not good, so we wanted to have more tenants. I knew that having one capital source was not a good idea, so we would have multiple capital sources. And I knew that just having government reimbursed assets, which was the source of all of the disruption, was also not a good idea. So we came up with a strategic plan that was simple, yet very powerful. And I that's what I added and then recruited the team, you know, because we I really then said, okay, we're gonna, we have this strategic plan of growing and diversifying. We need a team with leaders who would be teams of one to help us execute on this plan and had the, again, the, the foresight and persistence to recruit the right people. And we were off to the races. And that's really what I brought. It's quite simple, but hard to do. <laughs> super, super hard to do. And I, I love hearing you talk through it. You, you've said that you, you, Venta sits at the intersection of real estate and healthcare. Uh, it's actually, the, the concept makes perfect sense when you hear it, when you hear you say it. In the, you know, early 2000s, sitting at the crossroads of healthcare and real estate was not somewhere that a lot of people, that was not a corner a lot of people hung out on. When you talk about building that strategic plan, if you think about coming into the to the brush fire, if you will, or the dumpster fire that you that you stepped into in 2000, when was it that you actually had the opportunity to say, okay, we're out of the penalty box, if you will, and we're ready to get back and play a normal game? What what time frame was that? And is there a seminal a moment where, sort of, if you will, the 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 the, the future where you could kind of really step forward? showed itself. You said, no, 2008 was an incredible year for us because of this or that, or, you know, 2008 was obviously a terrible year uh, in the overall world economy. So where was it that you could really start to put your foot on the pedal? So there are different phases. So 99 to 01 was really the restructuring. And at that point in time, we were the centrifugal force in a multi-billion dollar restructuring of our only tenant who was, had filed for bankruptcy. So they emerged from bankruptcy in 2001 with a good business and a sustainable capital structure of which we were the largest part. So that was the first phase. The second phase was really thinking about selling ourselves. And it was relatively short-lived, and that was, I really had to make the case as to why we now had, yes, we still had one tenant, but we had this unbelievably growing, reliable cash flow from this, this single tenant. And as I would go around and talk to people and make the case of what it could be, everyone was like, you know, didn't want to talk to me. I remember Mike Bassatelli saying, Debbie, we have to stop talking. People are going to think we're going to buy you <laughs> and my stock will go down. <laughs> I mean, that's how bad it was that that exciting intersection of healthcare and real estate. And I was trying to make this macro point and getting us in the, the indices that was really important because we weren't in the stock indices and explaining how this was 20% of GDP and it was not a niche sector. It's a main food group. And I had some success, but limited. And so in making that case, I sort of convinced myself that we had an incredible growth opportunity. And so that's what we did really from 03, after we hired the team, all the way up until the financial crisis, when we were insightful enough and had really understood that things were not as they should be. And we were really went into the crisis in a highly over equitized position, very strong financially. And that, and that helped us. So we were good during those years. And then we came out really hard and hit the accelerator after the financial crisis and did billions and billions of consolidation. So you now own over 1,100 assets and they're across various, if you will, food groups inside of the healthcare space. Yes. So you've got yes. seniors housing, you've got medical office, you've got rehab facilities. Talk for a moment about that diversification because there are a lot of people who think Ventus and they say, oh, 
they, they operate seniors housing facilities and you don't operate senior housing facilities. You own seniors housing facilities that other operators operate very much similar to the hospitality market where Hilton and, and Marriott don't really own the real estate. They just operate them and somebody else actually owns the real estate. So to anybody who doesn't understand Ventus, they own the real estate. They don't operate the assets. But talk about going from being really focused on the senior space specifically, and then broadening it out to medical office, rehab, hospitals, all the, all the tech investments you've made. And we'll get to that in a moment, but just talk about the overall portfolio today. Well, what's really important, again, is this intersection of healthcare and real estate is a huge part of GDP. It's a huge real estate market, and it's highly fragmented. What ties our five verticals together is really these are all within this healthcare and they are demographically driven forms of real estate that the, that the users, the ultimate users, whether they're senior housing residents or people who are going to use the drugs that are, that are discovered in our labs or visits to medical office, they're all driven by specific demographic and healthcare trends. And again, the diversification is a reaction against those early days. And it served us incredibly well in this last year. And sometimes I think real estate investors do not understand that power of the different verticals within an overarching demographically driven umbrella, both on the ability to play offense and then on the ability to play defense like we did this last year during COVID. And so we have a strategically curated the portfolio to be in senior housing, as you say, that plays to those over 85 population, over 80, which is growing, you know, 17 and a half percent over the next five years. It plays to baby boomers, 10,000 of which will turn Medicare eligible every day. They visit the doctor five times as much as the rest of the population. So that plays to the medical office. And then if you think about life science, the life science really is to promote longer, healthier lives. So by 2030, 171 million people will have chronic conditions. Those, it's going to be the most efficient, cost-effective way to care for those conditions to prolong and make our lives better and stay outside of the hospital if we are able to develop cures and treatments for some of these chronic conditions as we age. And so they're all tied together. They all have different drivers and different structures. Um, and senior housing is less than 50% of it, but it's a business that, you know, I think is going to be coming back very strongly, but obviously was affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Dive into that for a second as it relates to COVID's impact on seniors housing. It, it started inside of a seniors housing community up in the state of Washington. Um, technology has sort of changed the way that uh, seniors are interfacing. And excuse me, I've got some alarm siren outside of our office building that's making a lot of noise. But um, the uh, uh, it's impacting the way that um, typically it's the eldest daughter who moves close to mom and dad to make sure that they're okay and goes and sees them and takes care of them and makes that decision about moving from either truly independent living to uh, assisted living or into seniors housing. How has the pandemic changed that view from your standpoint as it relates to specifically independent living and seniors housing? Yeah, well, I am a deep believer in the value that the care providers in senior living give to senior residents and their families. Um, and I, my parents were customers of the product, and so I saw it as a consumer as well. Senior living is really a consumer-driven business, and it is about socialization. It is about care. It is about um, safety. and we are seeing, and this is amazing to me, but it's extremely important to understand. In April of this year, last month, we saw more seniors move into senior, our senior living communities than we saw in any month since June of 2019. And what that says to you 
is we are offering something that is highly valuable to these residents and their families. After everything that we've been through and all the headlines, we have thrown everything we have at keeping seniors safe. We provide a safe environment, a healthy environment, an environment where people can socialize. You know, loneliness is more dangerous than smoking. I don't know if you know that, but that is a medical truism. And these communities really are homes for seniors where we know that they can talk to their neighbor, have communal activities, communal dining, and it really keeps people lively. And that's really important. So one of the things that um, I found to be very interesting in, in reading your quarterly um, report that you, you, when you did earnings last week, was the point that um, the average age of move-in on seniors housing is 84 years old. Mm -hmm. And back to your comment on demographics, that means that you haven't even started selling to baby boomers with that product. And that actually the product that you have today that actually gets to boomers is your medical office because they're Correct. the ones who are going and interfacing with doctors on a much more high frequency. Talk yeah. about those two products and then I want to get to research and development. Yes. So that you're hundred percent right. Now the what's called the oldest old, which is this kind of 80 and over demographic is incredibly fast growing. Again, it's going to go from 12 and a half million people now to 20 million by 2030. And it grows at a CAGR of three to 4% over the next couple of years and actually spikes 6% in, in 2027. So this is a very fast growing group. We're adding 2 million of those, of those potential customers, as I like to think about them, just over the next couple of years. And they are not the baby boomers. And you're correct. Then the baby boomers are their own cohort, 1946 to 64. Um, and they are the ones who are turning Medicare eligible, 10,000 a day. They're the ones who are going to the doctor's office much more frequently. Um, over 65 spend about 20,000 a year on medical care. A lot of that is in the medical office buildings. And so we're focused on these different cohorts really within the healthcare system. I've heard you talk about Ventus being a finance company. And I sit there and I stop and I say, hang on a second. Deb talks about Ventus being a finance company, but they are a real estate investment trust. And they also own over 1,100 physical assets. So explain to me how one should think about you as a finance company rather than as a real estate company. Yeah. I really, it's so interesting because it's hard. Ventus is at one level very simple, but it, at another somewhat complicated. So I'm always trying to explain to people what we do and how we do it. And so um, I think we're a third finance, a third real estate, a third healthcare. Um, and sometimes I say we're kind of like a private equity firm in a public shell. And what I mean by that is we invest in these healthcare businesses, typically via ownership in real estate. And it tends to be really a capital source for the leading providers of care. As we own the buildings, they can operate them. They take that capital. And if they're a, maybe a private equity owner, they can do a recapitalization. Um, if they are an owner operator, they can use that money for growth capital. It can be essentially 100% financing, if you will, because you know, and, and that's how a little bit financially, that's how people think about it. Now, we have to really understand that operator and that business and the position the business is in the marketplace, because what we're looking at is what is the sustainable EBITDA generation that can come from that building? And that's where it gets a little bit more like a private equity investment, but only in the real estate. So what about I, your- I hope or, that's clear. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah, no, it's clear. I guess now I'm going to go to another area that you're investing a lot of time and money and, and effort in. It's not quite 10% of your NOI, but in your research and development on the campuses of major top, top universities like Duke and Yale and other places where Ventus is going into partnerships with those universities to do R&D. And so now all of a sudden I'm saying, well, no, she's not a finance company. She's a biotech company. 
So, <laughs> no, I, I, I like to say that we aren't curing cancer, but we are supporting people who do. And that, okay. that's really, that's really what it is, Willie. I mean, I am super jazzed up about our life science and research and innovation business. We got into it about five years ago when we exited the nursing home business. We got into this life science business, and now we have over 9 million square feet. We have an incredible pipeline of, de of ground up development. As you say, we are really affiliated with the 15 largest, best research universities in the nation, whether it's Penn, Yale, Johns Hopkins, Wash U. I mean, it's incredible what these researchers and scientists do. And um, we are incredibly proud to be a part of it. And, and we've also recently found a way to invest in three of the top five, what are called cluster markets in life science that are really Cambridge. We did a billion dollar acquisition in South San Francisco this summer, which is a lab building that is, is, is really incredible. And then we just bought some life science on the, on the campus of uh, Johns Hopkins. And um, we're, we're extremely excited about the promise of this sector. The capital flows into the business, whether they're from the NIH or whether they're from venture capital funds, are just growing by leaps and bounds. And that supports, of course, the real estate utilization uh, of the buildings. And it's been one of the hottest asset classes, obviously, during the pandemic. It's cap rates have continued to compress and hopefully we've created a lot of value through this switcheroo between nursing homes and life science in 2016. So as you've grown Ventus, Deb, from a, a, you know, a good size, but relative to where you are today, very small company to a very large company, you're now generating $2 billion of NOI on an annual basis. How have you had to change the way you lead Well, I hope I've learned and I hope I've grown and matured as a leader. And some of it is almost required because of the scale and complexity of the businesses we're in. Some of it is freed up because of the incredible capabilities of the people who are at Ventus now. Um, I'm still... I still like to know the details. I do. There's certain areas where I can still add at a very granular level. And then in other areas, I can delegate and really play at a very kind of top level involved in decision making. And so I've evolved and learned. People have taught me. Again, just like I never took a business class, I never took a management class. And I do think I have some blind spots. I do. I think I have it's, blind spots. It's unbelievable management. you never took a management class. I have to tell you, <laughs> one of the most successful well, CEOs in the entire world never took a management class. So there's a lot about the value of my MBA. I'll tell you that. Well, I, I, I'm sure it served you incredibly well, but I do, I do have deficiencies in certain of these areas. And hopefully I have enough people sense and good intuition and experience and observation coupled with listening to people that I continue to be able to improve. Hear, hearing, hearing, you, hearing, hearing you talk about your attention to details makes me think back to your dinner table with your father and looking at the year of the silver coins. Um, so if I, Ventus has been extremely um, if you will, um, forward thinking as it relates to diversity. Your board is very diverse. Um, your management team is very diverse. ES, and you also won the 2021 Energy Star Partner of the Year Award from the US EPA in the Department of Energy. Uh, talk for a moment about diversity and how important it is to you and the way you run Ventus. Well, we are, it is true that Ventus has been a leader in this area, and it's something we've dedicated ourselves to um, for a decade or more. And on the people diversity front, on the board, we have 11 directors, four are women, two are black, 
everybody is incredibly accomplished and they make the company better. Our board is a, a competitive advantage. And when you look at data, the data tell you that diverse groups make better decisions and drive better returns. And really, if you can think about so many different areas, whether it's you know, financial returns, whether it's making business decisions, even, I don't know if you know this, but the cure for smallpox was developed because farmers and, and milkmaids were involved in, in making observations. And I just think that you're just so much more excellent if you have different viewpoints that are coming to the table. So that's been easy to, to dedicate myself to, and I'm glad that um, we continue to, to drive forward on diversity. In terms of some of the sustainability initiatives, again, I think it's really good business. And I think that we've done a lot of energy saving activities and sustainability activities that are great investments to improve the performance of the portfolio and also benefit the planet. So again, we try to find ways that are authentically Ventas that serve multiple purposes, including ESG. And again, ESG just is a fancy way of saying we're going to do the right thing for our employees, for our communities, and for our partners. And, and it's, it's very simple. But again, hard to do well. <laughs> Extremely hard to do well, and you've done it yes. exceptionally well. Thank um, you. Given that you are the longest tenured female CEO in the S&P 500, that's a pretty significant, uh, if you will, responsibility. How, how you're doing so much outside of Ventus and have been an incredible chairwoman of the Real Estate Roundtable, uh, which is where I spend the majority of my time with you. Um, but as I said at the top of the, of the webcast, you also have your, your mind and your, and your heart in a lot of other things. A, how long do we have you around at Ventus? And then second of all, what are the next chapters for you as it relates to the impact you want to make going forward? I mean, it is an honor to be the chair of the Roundtable and the Economic Club. And honestly, um, I can't believe I've been at Ventus for 22 years. The average public company CEO tenure is three to five years, something like that. And I'm sure you challenge yourself, just like I do, to to be different from that and better than that. And I have a theory that I'll try out on you that leaders are often built for a cycle or a certain set of facts. You know, I'm a growth guy, I'm a workout guy, I'm a cost cutting guy, whatever the case may be. And I think I've always challenged myself to say, can I be the person that the company needs? Can I be nimble enough and adaptable enough to see what's coming and adapt to what's needed. And that is that is something that um, I want to be and have tried to be as Ventas has gone through these macro cycles, as well as you know specific things that have affected the company over the years. And um, I'm proud of that and I hope to keep learning and keep doing that. I'm uh, all in. I, um, I had lunch with Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, uh, just before the pandemic. So um, a year and a half ago in his office in Boulder. And as Jim and I were talking, he sort of said, you know, it's pretty evident, Willie, that you're pretty good at what you do. How long are you to keep doing it? And I said to him, you know, I love what I do, Jim. I have no plans on retiring anytime soon. I'm at that time, 53 years old. And uh, I said, but you know, at some point I would think about, I don't know, running a nonprofit or doing something in the public service realm or something else, but who knows? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't think you ought to do anything else because I think your best years are going to be between 60 and 75 years old. And what was so, I thought, I, what I loved about that, Deb, was two things. One, he was basically telling me that I'm not as good today as I think I am, which I thought was great. And then second of all, just the concept that a decade from now, I'll even be better at what I'm doing than I am today is a really fun thing to think about. 
And to your point, there aren't that many CEOs because many companies are run by sort of hired guns, if you will. And you and I do have the great uh, luxury, if you will, of being both chairman and CEO of companies that started very small and have gotten quite large. And that gives us the ability from a tenure standpoint to just sort of stick around and keep on growing it as long as we're getting better and better every year. Well, and look at what you just did with Ivy Zellman, which I read about. I mean, you have to be willing to reinvent yourself, to reinvent the company, and to learn. And if you do, and you love what you do, and the people you do it with, uh, I think uh, we're in very lucky positions to be able to continue to lead our respective organizations. So Mary Lemieux calls you up and says, I'm putting together an investor group to buy out the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, you've already told us your, you know, your experience being a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, but talk about hockey and talk about becoming part of the managing committee at the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yes. Well, if there's anything you can understand about me after this hour conversation, is you know, what would a working class girl from Pittsburgh who loves sports made good do? She wouldn't buy a yacht. She wouldn't, you know, I don't know what, but sports is always where I come back to. And the opportunity to be partners with great Mario Lemieux, a great organization in the Pittsburgh Penguins, um, and drink from the Stanley Cup, which is stands still as the greatest moment of my life, bar none, um, has really energized me in a way that um, I haven't, you know, I really can't think of anything else that would, that would bring that to my life. It's brought my extended family together. I'm able to really enjoy it with, with friends and, and uh, colleagues. And it, it's just been a great part of my life. And so it's a natural extension of my life. And um, I'm, again, lucky as could be to be a part of it. And now we're getting ready for the playoffs, Willie. I know we are. And, and, <laughs> and I align with you on pretty much everything, Deb, other than your love of the Pittsburgh Penguins versus my <laughs> Washington Capitals. I was going to say as an owner, couldn't you do something to just get Crosby to retire a little bit early? Because he is such an incredible player. Well, maybe we'll see each other at one of the playoff games if we're lucky. That would be a lot of fun. Yes. Um, Deb, this has been a real pleasure. I am so just in awe of your career, your track record, your success, the returns you have provided to your shareholders, and the vision that you've given to Ventus and, and what you have created there. And then also all the time and efforts that you give to others in your philanthropy and in all of the nonprofits that you are on the board of. And uh, for you to take an hour and talk to me about your fantastic career is a real honor. And so thank you for taking the time. I look forward to seeing you at the next roundtable meeting. And um, I hope everybody has a fantastic day. And I look forward to seeing you all on the Walker webcast next Wednesday. Thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be with you, Willie. Have a great day. Bye-bye.